So, today, um, pr today's presentation here is on leveling up your dev skills with static analysis. So, um, before I jump into the topic, though, I uh, want to just give a quick background on who I am and you know, why I'm here. So, my name is David Lindsay from the States. I, uh, I uh, have a background in security. I started out actually uh, studying at university in the States, uh, mathematics, got a master's degree in pure math, and from there I thought I'd kind of transition into uh, kind of a Java developer career actually, and so, um, but since I was competing with uh, a lot of students coming out of school that had more of a CS background than I did, uh, the study computer science, um, I initially got a job just doing quality assurance, and. I happened to be, a, you know, as my first project was assigned to a very large Java web application. And so I was doing, you know, quality assurance testing on this. And um, this was right around the time Selenium was coming out. So we wrote a lot of Selenium tests, and um, which was really fun at the time. But uh, one of the things that I noticed uh, was that um, there was, you know, some issues with the application on the security side. And I was complete novice to security at this point. Um, but it really kind of piqued my interest. So I started testing this, you know, this Java application for certain security issues. And so I would go, like, you know, read online about some new type of vulnerability, like cross-site scripting or SQL injection, and then I'd go try it out on this web app. And almost every single time, I could find that this app was vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And that was really kind of cool to me, because I kept finding more and more and more of these interesting security issues. And so, you know, that kind of led me into taking, a, instead of going down a development career path, I decided to instead focus, you know, on a, a security career. And so I got a job as a security consultant. Later on, I worked as a security engineer, um, moved to a different, you know, consulting company and uh, became director of penetration testing for a while. Um, and then kind of hopped around in a few different places. But now I am a, kind of a security evangelist at uh, Coverity. So um, that's why I'm here today, because, you know, a, a, the kind of core of, of anything on the application security side is developers. And so I think it's really important that, you know, developers understand their role they play in securing applications. Um, so that's, that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about. <clears throat> so I kind of broke the outline here into just a few basic, you know, categories. Um, and, and trying to keep it really simple, straightforward. Um, so basically I want to talk about, you know, well, these categories. I'm not going to go through them all now, but you can see them here. Um, so the first topic here is how to fail as a developer. So there's lots of things that can go wrong when you're a developer. Um, we all, you know, have you know these kind of things that we need to work, watch out for, regardless of our job. But these are just a few of the common ones that developers encounter. So the first one is, you know, you don't meet your deadlines, right? That's really, you know, nobody likes that when that happens, and it ha unfortunately tends to be a common problem because, you know, uh, managers oftentimes have a hard time estimating how long it takes to do things, and customers are very demanding and all, so on and so on. But, you know, this is not something I can really speak to too much, just wanted to point it out. Something that gets, strikes a little bit closer to home is, you know, this other problem in development where things are, how should I say, brittle. Um, things are maybe a little bit overly complicated or perhaps um, things just don't perform as well as they should. Uh, raise your hand real quick if, you know, these types of issues are familiar in your code writing. Yeah? So I see quite a few hands raise up. I'm going to have, try to have some audience participation, so please, you know, feel free to, you know, have, you know, encourage me and, you know, give me good feedback when I ask questions. So this is a common problem, right? Um, there's lots of, you know, the reasons that this happens. There's tools out there that can help with this. SonarCube, for example, is a very popular uh, tool that a lot of people can use for free. Raise your hand if you're an open uh, SonarCube user, right? Good, good. So that's excellent because it definitely is a tool that can help you find these kind of performance bottlenecks. It also reports lots of other interesting metrics about your code. Um, one category that SonarCube does uh, cover is something called uh, static analysis. Um, and this is all about bug finding in your code. So even though you know, SonarCube does a lot of other things, um, bugs is just like one category within there. And it happens to be a very important category. Um, a lot of uh, code has defects. You know, the easy kinds of defects to find are the ones that make your code not compile, right? Because, you know, you have to fix those before you can move forward. Um, but then there's these, like, more sneaky runtime kind of issues that are um, harder to detect. And that's why we have unit tests in place to help us find these kind of issues. We also do, you know, quality assurance testing and all sorts of other things. I'll talk a little bit more about, about those down the road. But I just want it to be clear in everybody's mind that when we're talking about static analysis and 
Um, we're, we're talking about these kind of bugs in your code, not, not the performance kind or bottlenecks. We're talking about actual you know, defects in the code. <clears throat> so, so, you know, there's uh, a few things that we can really identify right off the top, you know, r real easily that, that can help you so that your code is a little bit more um, usable. So I just want to talk about a couple of those. Um, so the first thing I want to point I want to emphasize is just that, you know, you're not an expert at everything. Um, I'm not an expert at everything. This, you know, this kind of applies to everyone. I don't want to be picking just on developers. But, you know, security is something that I have an extensive background in by this point. And I just want to highlight kind of a few things that maybe, you know, from a security point of view that, that de most developers are not familiar with. But we'll start out kind of, kind of simple. So raise your hand real quick if this is, you know, if you're familiar with cross-site request forgery. Hands. So, so you know, maybe half or so of the audience raise their hand. Okay, keep your hands up. Um, so, what about um, if you're familiar with the confused deputy problem? Okay, quite a few hands drop. A few more. Uh, a couple hands are still up. So, I'm not going to go into the details, but the cross-site request forgery is you know somewhat related to the confused deputy problem. Um, but what about uh, cross-site scripting? Raise your hands. Is this familiar? Yeah. So even more hands went up than originally. Yeah. Okay. What about um, DOM-based cross-site scripting? Any hands up? So there's, yeah, a few hands, but not as many as before, okay? I'm gonna keep going. Um, what protections are built into, you know, JavaScript on the client side inside a browser to enforce the same origin policy? Anybody familiar with this? So the, again, a few hands, but by, by far, you know, the minority in the room here. Um, I, I mentioned this because it's important for things like cross-site scripting and several other types of security vulnerabilities. Um, what about uh, which HTTP, HTTP headers are useful for, um, you know, to, to make it harder to exploit something like cross-site scripting? Anybody familiar with those? Anybody want to yell out an example? Anyone? So there's one called x-xss-protection that, um, kind of uh, originally came out with uh, Internet Explorer a few years ago. So that's one example, um, but you know, there's many. Um, I won't get into the details too much of that one either. Just want to emphasize that there's a lot of nuanced knowledge here in the security world related to you know, making applications more secure. Um, this one, hopefully more hands will go up, but how many people are familiar with uh, properly mitigating cross-site scripting using something like output sanitization? So. Again, you know, a few hands, a few more hands are up, but um, still in the minority. Of those that you know have their hands up for this, how many have actually written a, some sort of sanitization routine for cross-site scripting? So uh, you know, just uh, you know, maybe less than ten people, maybe five or six. So that's not good or bad. There's a lot of libraries that you can use for cross-site scripting mitigation as well. So you know, in, in lieu of writing your own, maybe you're using one of those libraries, which is fine. Um, so I've talked a little bit about you know some issues, but I wanted to go into a little bit more detail tell real quick on what exactly is cross-site scripting. So I'll, I'll do it using you know, the most simple type of application I can. So you know, usually the first thing people write in a new language is a hello world application, right? Um, and for like a web application, oftentimes the second one you write is something that says, instead of hello world, hello, and then you fill in the username, right? So it can demonstrate the principles of you know, user input and, and getting request values and things like that. So, um, my little web demo here works. If I'm online, this should work. So I did this in JSP. So I just um, made it so that I can say hello world, but the world part is a variable that comes in from the uh, a get variable here, right? Everybody with me so far? So if this works, I actually didn't check my internet. Oh, good, my internet connection is working. So, um, so I can put in dynamic data. So. If I wanted to say, like, hello, David, then simple, right? It shows up, hello, David, right? And this is all done just with a simple JSP tag, nothing fancy. Um, so what is cross-site scripting? Well, cross-site scripting happens when I, you know, you know, when somebody, you know, malicious, an attacker, decides to do something um, a little bit more interesting, like instead of just saying, hello, David, they say, hello, script, alert, zero, close script. So if you're having trouble reading, all I'm doing is typing up there uh, my name, and then I just put in a simple JavaScript that will execute an alert command. And what happens when I submit it? Well, the alert ran, right? And it's pretty easy to see why that works, because if you look at the source code, um, all that's happening is my variable is getting substituted in here. And since I'm putting in my name, but then I'm also putting in HTML tags, 
and they're not being sanitized on the server side, they just get reflected back to the user and the script executes. And that can be a bad thing because an attacker could create such a link like what I wrote just before and send this to an uh, unsuspecting victim. And if that user, the victim user you know, follows this link, then, then that script will execute in their browser. And that's bad because then that JavaScript can do things like access their cookies or maybe execute functionality in the application on their behalf. If they're an authenticated user for this application, they can, you know, and anything that that user can do can, can probably be automated through JavaScript. And so lots of bad things. Kind of the canonical example is just to use JavaScript that will steal their cookies and send it to the attacker on a, you know, some third party website. And then the attacker can log in as that user. So basically, it allows you to take over their account. Obviously, that's a bad thing, right? You don't want your bank account to be vulnerable to, to this, right? Otherwise, a victim user who can just get you to click on a single link will be able to have full access to your bank account, right? OK, so that's why cross-scripting is bad. Now, so I showed you the source here, right? So it's just, um, so it just injected the, well, the HTML source. So I just injected, you know, script alert zero, close script. And the question is, you know, how would you properly sanitize for something like this? Um, Anybody feel real confident that they'd know what to do to stop this from happening? So just uh, one or two hands, not very many, okay? So I'm going to go through a few examples, back to my presentation, of things that you know, developers have actually done when I've presented them with this kind of an issue. So, um, so just kind of bear with me, and you can help me gauge you know, whether these are, are useful preventions or not. Um, the first one, so, oh, so I first will just show you the examples that I just did. Okay, so for the prevention side. Um, so the first, you know, completely um, silly one is just blocking the word alert. Does that work? Obviously not, because alert, well, that wasn't even the attack. That was just the proof of concept of the attack. So you block the word alert, you aren't even accomplishing anything. Not only that, if I still want to execute an alert, I can. There's lots of different ways I can create an alert that would bypass a simple filter for the word alert. So that's one example. Um, what about blocking script tags? Is that something familiar? So anybody think this would be more effective? Yeah, so it's maybe you know a step better, but again, you know, there's lots of things I can do to bypass the script tag. For example, if I inject uh, an image tag and I make it so that the source of that image is something that doesn't exist, and then I can do an event handler like uh, on error. So when that image doesn't load, the on error event handler triggers, and then whatever follows that, you know, whatever value is passed to the event handler, that's JavaScript code that executes, and it, there's no script tag anywhere there, right? So that's another way to execute um, arbitrary JavaScript and not even use the word script. Pretty clever, right? Um, so say, you know, as the next line of defense, you know, a developer blocks all event handlers, right? Well, even then, there's some like esoteric ways you could um, get around that, or you know, depending on the type of encoding on the page, sometimes an attacker can control how the page is encoded. Um, so there's some weird things like that. But on the other hand, there's also like in Internet Explorer, there's a whole other scripting language that's available, VBScript, right? So sometimes that's available to bypass you know filters like this. There's a uh, so let's kind of take it up to the next level. So say that all characters, um, uh, all alphabetical characters, A through Z. And, um, and things like the angle brackets are blocked too. Anybody think I can still inject JavaScript? So a couple of people know where I'm going, yeah. So, um, so depending on the output context, I maybe still can. So if I'm just injecting into the uh, normal HTML, like the example I gave earlier, maybe this would be pretty good. But um, say I'm injecting into uh, a string in JavaScript, then I can do something um, a little bit more uh, interesting. So, so First off, has anybody heard of the esoteric programming language called BrainFuck? OK, so it's kind of like a, just a proof of concept type of language that uses only eight characters to do the, and, and every command, everything you do in the entire programming language is done with one of eight characters, right? That's pretty cool, right? Well, this is even better. JSFuck is um, uh, just a subset of JavaScript. Oh, fun. Um, Go away. Um, so it's just a subscript of JavaScript. It doesn't require any sort of special compiler. Any default compiler built into a browser will execute this. And the code looks like this, the actual um, uh, JS fuck code. So it just uses these six characters that are right here, uh, open and close parentheses, open and close brackets, uh, plus and uh, bang. So those six characters, I can do arbitrary JavaScript. And so if I can use something like this to escape or to, to inject into JavaScript, then I can um, execute. And just to kind of prove that it works, like um, I'm going to do like an alert box. So let's say I just wanted to alert. 
hello DevOps, right? Okay, so that's my, going to be my, my injection. I'll encode it, and then just to verify that it runs, and you see, pops up hello DevOps. No special compiler or anything, just what's built into the browser. So, you know, even in really, you know, you know, strange cases, it's still possible to do, um, you know, where there's a lot of, you know, weird filtering going on. It's still possible in some cases to inject arbitrary JavaScript, which if you're, a, you know, a, a penetration tester like I am, you know, that's pretty cool, right? Okay, so at the end of the day, I, the, the moral of all this, you know, the point I'm trying to get across is that there's a lot of, you know, detailed knowledge that goes into breaking applications, and, and, and that's what people like me you know, spend a lot of time, I've spent years and years researching these kind of techniques on how to bypass filters and how to, you know, understand how XML can be abused, how SVG files can be abused, how the same origin policy works, and that's just something that most developers don't have a lot of expertise in, no fault of your own. Um, but you guys are all excellent at understanding your code and your languages, right? So I want to talk about how you can still use that to your advantage and still do the right things so that your applications are being appropriately secured. So there's quite a few different testing activities that a developer can actually do um, to make their applications more secure and less like, you know, less brittle. Um, so I just created a list here of several different things. Um, some of them are more common, some of them are less common, some are more security focused, some are less, but let's just go through these real quick. So security training is obviously helpful for any developer, right? Raise your hand if you've ever actually done some security, you know, targeted security training. So again, you know, if quite a few hands went up, but less than half. Um, um, what about, uh, so the manual code review, glorified grep is kind of similar, but you know, you kind of use grep to make things a little bit more efficient. When, as a security consultant, I actually would do this a lot because I'd oftentimes be told to do a code review on code, but I wasn't able to compile it. So I had to just kind of start from nothing and be like, okay, what's there to look at? And when you have a, you know, two million lines of code to look at and you only have like four hours, you kind of have to use tools like that to make things a little faster. But still it was, you know, basically just a manual code review. Um, Next up, uh, lint checkers and unit tests. So raise your hand if you're a developer that you know, uses these. Okay, yeah, so probably over half raise their hands there. And that's, you know, that's pretty typical. I'd expect most people to be doing these kinds of, uh, of uh, checkers to help you know, make sure their code's good. Um, then we have static analysis, which obviously I'm gonna talk about in a little bit, so I'll pass on that for now. Um, there's dynamic and runtime analysis. So this is like where you start getting to the point where you can run your application and you can then interact with it kind of a, as a black box. Um, so you can, you know, write unit or you can write like Selenium tests. You can um, do penetration testing against the application. There's automated security scanners that will scan the web. App well, first, they kind of will spider your application to try to figure out where all the pages are and invoke custom workflows and things. And then they will start, you know injecting, you know, things like the script tag that I just showed. So they'll do that kind of testing all automated from a runtime point of view. Um, there's manual penetration testing, which I did many years. Um, threat modeling is actually a really useful thing. Uh, it's kind of more of like a architecture type of design, but there's places that, you know, where developers are expected to do this as well. Raise your hand if you've ever have done threat modeling real quick. I see maybe one hand. <laughs> okay. Um, so you probably work at Microsoft or one of the few other companies where, where developers are expected to do this. Um, um, and again, that kind of goes along well with architectural analysis. And I shouldn't even put web application firewalls up there. It's kind of a lousy solution, but there's a lot of tools out there or vendors out there pushing them. So I figured I'd mention it. Um, so a lot of these um, aren't very well suited for developers. Certainly they're, they're things you could do or take part of, but they're not necessarily, there's oftentimes other people on your team that would be better, like architects would be better suited for doing some of the threat modeling um, and so forth. So I wanted to focus on just ones that um, are maybe better for developers. Um, and of these, you're probably already doing lint checkers and unit tests, and I, so I don't want to focus on them. Um, so that pretty much leaves um, the security training and um, the static analysis. So. Security training is something I definitely encourage everyone out here to, you know, to, to do whenever you get the chance. There's a lot of good, uh, you know, good courses out there that are available. Um, but the rest of my talk will be kind of focused on the static analysis because it's really um, a tool that enables developers to find and fix issues, especially, especially security issues, kind of as a front line of defense, right? <clears throat> Okay, so what the hell is static analysis? I keep talking about it and keep kind of 
beating, you know, kind of going around. But let's just kind of, you know, jump on, you know, focus on this now for the rest of the talk. So static analysis is basically a way of taking your code, we input into the static analysis engine, and what do you get out? You get out, you know, a list of, of issues in your code. So it'll be like, okay, on this line of code you have a bug, on this line of code you have a bug, right? So another way of thinking about it is that you take, you know, nice little simple input, and you get this nice ugly garbage out about, you know, kind of highlighting all the bad things in your code. And even better, you know, we put like a little bow on top to try to make it look prettier, right? Um, um, it's really not that bad, but um, the, what, what actually is going on inside the hood, what, uh, you know, inside that analysis engine? Well, it's actually a lot of, you know, complicated um, analysis techniques that are going on there. Um, I'm not going to have time to go into all the details, but, you know, the, the, the core, you know, a good analysis engine will kind of mimic your compiler in terms of wanting to understand, you know, what the abstract, abstract syntax tree and the control flow graph of your application looks like. And then you can start to model different states of the application and see how, you know, what states the application can be in that will allow you to access certain parts of the code. And, and to do this well, you know, it's a very, you know, it's, you know, you're navigating, navigating this path into different states, um, and there's lots of shortcuts you have to take to make that so it's something that can complete in a reasonable amount of time, because the number of states your application can be in is almost, you know, uncountable. So, um, so there's all sorts of different heuristics and techniques that are used to, to make that, you know, a process that's doable in real time. Um, to really understand the details, I'm not going to be able to cover that in a 30-minute talk. So here's a good starting point. Um, this is kind of like a graduate-level textbook. Um, and if you have a little bit of a math background, it's a good starting point. Um, but so I want to change gears a little bit now and talk about how you know, a static analysis tool can, can fail as well, just you know, like we all can. So what are some of the bad things that can go wrong with the static analysis tool? Um, well, the first thing is, is that it just misses the obvious, right? If there's some obvious bug in your code, you know, maybe you intentionally planted it there just to see, and you run a static analysis tool against it, and it misses that obvious bug. That obviously is a, you know, kind of a worst case scenario for a static analysis tool, right? So you want tools that actually can find things. What's hard, though, about doing static analysis is that oftentimes, you know, and this is you know, kind of true for any testing technique, but it's hard to know you know, what defects are actually in your code. If we, and therefore it's hard to measure how effective the tool is because you don't know what it's missing. For example, a lot of you might be doing unit tests and, and your unit tests have probably found things over the years, but there's maybe other issues out there that your unit tests aren't missing, but you don't know about them, right? And it's the same, you know, with any kind of tool. It's hard, you, we have this like big unknown in terms of, well, what actually is out there? Um, but regardless, you know, you want a tool that finds as many of those as possible, right? And so any tool that does a lousy job at finding the actual real defects in your code is something you want to avoid. Um, I want to talk a little bit about find bugs because I, want, I, I would somewhat put it in this category. It's not a bad tool, and it's definitely better than not using any sort of static analysis as, at all. Um, and if, like I said earlier, if you're using SonarCube, um, you're probably using find bugs by default under the hood as part of that analysis. So it's definitely a good starting point, but it's, I would, I'd say it's a shallow tool. It's a tool that um, finds a few things, but, but a lot of really deep, you know, critical um, security issues and quality defects, you're not gonna find with find bugs. Um, so this kind of just highlights, you know, some of the different categories of what it looks for. Um, and, uh, you know, a, an analysis tool that does you know, more deep analysis will kind of cover all of these different categories. Um, and then just kind of as an example comparison in terms of what bugs are actually found. So like a deep analysis tool will find, you know, may maybe like only 128 defects in a particular application, whereas find bugs would find a lot more. But there's two issues. One is that those 978 issues are all more like stylistic or, or you know, kind of best practices type of things, and they're not things that are high severity defects. Um, and also, of those 978, a good number of them are actually just going to be false positives. We'll talk about those in just a second. <clears throat> okay, so talk about it right now. So on the other flip side, you know, of a tool that doesn't detect anything is a tool that reports way too many things, right? Um, so anybody can write a 100% a, a you know, accurate uh, you know, static analysis tool that just flags every line of code. And what does it get you? Well, nothing. Like, this is completely meaningless, right? But there's tools that, out there that are, you know, 
you know, are actually you know, surprisingly close to this, where they just report way too many issues. And when you actually go through and look at each individual issue, you'll find that maybe one out of every 20, one out of every 50 defects that it's reporting is actually a real thing. The rest, you know, like 49 out of 50, are just flat out wrong. They are not things you'd want to fix. So a tool that reports this much garbage is obviously not something that a developer would want to use, right? Now, there, I don't want to, you know, there are tools out there that are like this. I don't want to, you know, completely say they're useless because for somebody like me who used to do security, security consulting, using a tool like this was still kind of a step better than just doing a complete manual um, code review because rather than, you know, looking through thousands of lines of code for, you know, a particular defect, it at least, you know, helps me narrow down maybe to, you know, certain parts of the code where more interesting things are going on. And so it's still kind of a, a, a shortcut, you know, on top that's better than doing a manual code review in some ways. But for a developer, this is completely useless, right? So that's why I want to focus, you know, as a developer who's looking for a static analysis tool as opposed to a security, you know, consultant, you know, you don't want to use a tool that has this problem. You want to have a tool that has a much higher um, false positive rate, or excuse me, a much lower false positive rate. You don't want the false positives, right? <clears throat> um, okay, so, so those are a couple of the big categories. Let's talk about, you know, just some things, you know, that, that a static analysis tool can do well that you want to look for if you are, you know, so you're chosen, you are identified to help choose a static analysis tool for your team. What do you want to look for? So we already talked about, the, you know, the first couple of issues. You don't want something that, that misses obvious defects or even, you know, hard to find defects. You want a tool that can, that can really do a good job at finding those hard to identify defects. You want a tool that doesn't, you know, flood you with garbage. You want something that quickly, uh, a tool that helps you quickly identify whether an issue is real or not, right? Um, and it will ideally do that by showing you inside your code the context of the vulnerability and allow you to quickly navigate around the code um, just like your IDE does, or maybe even integrate into your IDE. Um, you want a tool that provides helpful remediation advice. Um, you know, again, this is something that's more of a thing a developer would care about. As a security consultant, security engineer, I wouldn't care so much about that because I already you know, knew what to recommend or I could oftentimes provide better remediation advice than what the tool would report because I could customize things to the application much better. But um, you know, a tool that can do that, you know, can provide customized remediation advice is obviously very helpful for developers. Um, um, a tool that is customizable, so something that allows, you know, there's, there's all sorts of, you know, ways that a static analysis engine will, um, can fail in terms of understanding your code, but something that's customizable will allow you to kind of fill in some of those gaps so that the analysis will be much more complete. Um, so customization is definitely important. Um, reporting capabilities is, is oftentimes mentioned as an issue. You want, um, you know, this is maybe something that developers care a little bit less about, but maybe for your managers or people that want to, you know, see, you know, why is this tool helping you? Being able to generate reports or show that you're actually improving your code over time, you know, having good reporting capabilities is key to doing that. Um, Integration with other third-party applications is crucial. Obviously, you want a tool that can integrate well with your build server or your IDEs, but there's lots of other, you know, maybe you're, you want to integrate with your bug tracking system so that you can automatically push defects to it, or maybe you want a tool that integrates with um, your, you know, code check-in server so that if a vulnerability is identified, um, you know, maybe the static analysis engine can go and look at who checked in that code, and then maybe it could automatically notify that developer, hey, that piece of code you checked in yesterday, here's like, you know, three issues in that code that you maybe want to go check out. That's really cool, right? It's very, definitely a time saver, right? <clears throat> okay, so um, oh wait, before I move on, so I've talked about a few things here. There's actually a really nice website that you can go to. Um, I'll bring it up here in my browser real quick. So this is, go to the right one here. Um, yeah, so the um, Static Analysis Technologies Evaluation Criteria, or SATEC. Um, so this is just a list that has been put together by a bunch of security experts in terms of what sorts of things you should look for in a good um, static analysis engine. And it covers a lot of the, you know, all the things that I mentioned before, but it goes through in a little bit more detail about different things. Um, let me get to the actual content here. So, you know, it talks about, you know, how the tool is deployed, um, what the deployment models could be, um, what kind of support you get, um, what the architecture is like, you know, runtime dependencies, you know, what technologies it support, third-party libraries, what languages are supported. So it kind of just kind of goes through some of those same categories that I mentioned earlier, but provides a much more comprehensive, you know, 
uh, package of things to look for. So again, if you're ever you know assigned to or you ever have the you know want to you know do an intelligent job and in terms of identifying a good tool, you know this is a great starting point. And this is very vendor neutral. This is um, all done at uh, webappsec.org, which is a nonprofit you know vendor new independent consortium that um, is just out there to help pro you know provide good information about these types of things. So. Definitely something to check out. I can um, tweet this afterwards, you know, a, a link to this if that makes it easier. Um, okay, so back to the presentation. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the specific kinds of uh, bugs and defects that a static analysis tool can find. Um, there's a lot of uh, you know different categories, um, but for security, by far the biggest category is called data flow, and there's different kinds of issues that fall in this. So first, I just want to describe the data flow issue kind of at a high level, just so it's clear what I'm talking about. So you have you know in a data flow, what you want to do is is identify sources and sinks in the code, and a source is going to be anywhere where you have untrusted data that enters the application, right? Um, so this you know could be untrusted data coming from you know forms in a web application you know, like get or post variables could come in this way um, anything submitted by the user whether it's cookies or headers could be considered as as you know a source um, for like a client side application maybe anything on the file system would be considered untrusted or environment variables might be untrusted um, um, depending on how your application is deployed, for example, maybe the database that it you know reads from is not trusted. Maybe there's other you know at related applications that write to the same database. But if that data they're writing is not trusted, then maybe you don't trust the data that you're pulling out, or even you maybe don't even trust it because your own application doesn't sanitize what goes into the database. So there's all sorts of you know different things that you may choose to trust or not trust, and and so any of those you know places where that untrusted data comes in, we'd call a source, right? Okay, so then the other end you have sinks, and that's where that you know data ends up getting used. So it could be, for example, um, you know data that gets reflected back to the user as part of an HTML page. That would be the exact example that we looked at earlier with cross-site scripting, right? That untrusted data sent back to an HTML page. You know, bad things can happen. Um, but there's lots of other types of sinks. Like if that untrusted data gets concatenated to a string that's like a SQL query string, and then that SQL query is executed against the database. Well, you probably have it. You know, there's a good chance that you now have created a SQL injection vulnerability. Um, there's also, you know, things like uh, where the untrusted data gets used, um, where it gets evaluated as OGNL in a Struts application, for example. If that's the case, you might have um, arbitrary code, in, you know, code execution that could happen. Or if it could, if that untrusted data is written to an XML file, you could have XML injection. So there's all sorts of these, you know, different kind of outputs where where if the Attacker, you know, a bad user is able to, you know, inject that data, and it ends up in the, these kind of sinks. That's a bad thing. We call those data flow issues. Um, so cross-site scripting. So I kind of already mentioned most of these, so I'll skip that. Um, so you know, those are definitely you know interesting class of vulnerability. Um, before I go on to copy paste errors, I just wanted to show another um, example real quick of of. Um, so one of the examples I just mentioned actually was OGNL injection. And so this is something that's unfortunately plagued Struts applications, uh, Struts 2 in particular. Real quick, anybody use Struts 2? So I see quite a few hands go up. So um, just word of caution, make sure you stay updated on the latest versions of Struts 2 or else something like this could happen. Um, so this is just a simple web form using you know, real basic struct actions. And in this, for this particular proof of concept, um, the, all that I need to have is that the form itself has a validation error so that it prompts the user to submit again. And so I do that by having a second field here that I'll just leave blank. Anyways, the injection all happens here. So if I just um, put in um, some OGNL code here, something like one plus three. Um, so if um, it just returns the string back unchanged, then there's probably nothing going on. But what happens if I submit it and it returns back the sum of one plus three? That's a little bit fishy, right? So it doesn't necessarily prove that there's code injection. But what if I put in something like, um, uh, if I can get this right. So I'm going to type in java.lang.math uh, at, and then I can reference a variable here, a static variable. Um, so I'm going to put in pi. Um, submit that. And what do we get? We get a pi back, right? So that should be, you know, <laughs> definitely um, like a, a, a red flag should be going off now. It's like, hey, that's not good. I just uh, referenced a, a, a native Java, Java class and a, you know, a constant within that class, and it, 
did the substitution for me. So it turns out this is actually really basic, straightforward um, OGNL code injection that's available. And, and unfortunately, a lot of older versions of struts, in fact, most all older versions of struts over the last three or four years are vulnerable to this. So if you're using struts too, definitely make sure you stay up to date on the latest. Um, okay, so back to you know, some other different interesting classes of vulnerabilities. So one um, class that I actually find really interesting that I think you know, developers probably can relate to are co called copy-paste errors. And any good you know, intelligent static analysis engine should be able to you know, do these kind of things. So it's quite common for a developer to cut and paste code, right? It just saves a lot of time. But usually when you're doing that cut-paste, um, you don't want the code that's pasted to be exactly like the cut code. You probably want to, it's often you know, the case where you want to change some variable names and substitute them for something different. And so that's what you see here. The um, top if statement is pretty much the same as the bottom if statement, but the developer needed to change out a certain variable and replace it. So like you can see that in the first line where it's returns not equal no versus in the second example where it's locals not equal no, right? So can anybody, you know, you've, I've had it up here for a second. Has anybody spotted like what the copy paste error is? Raise your hands. So a couple hands go up. So in this case, it's um, right here at the very end where the um, value being returned should match what's in the original if statement. So the first one has returns not equal no at null, and then at the very end, it returns that variable. Well, here it's um, uh, a locals that should be the assignment rather than returns. So again, this is, you know, even if you're doing a manual code review or you wrote this code or, you know, somebody on your team wrote this code, if you're manually reviewing this code, these things are really easy to slip by because you really have to, like, study the code carefully to realize, oh, wait, that variable should be something different. So just for fun, here's another quick example. So again, this is a if, um, else if, else um, statement, and then it's followed by another if, else if, else statement. And so the second one is, you know, pretty much similar as the first. Raise your hand if you, you got the issue yet. I don't see any hands yet, okay. So again, that you know, emphasizes the point. These are hard to spot. So in this case, um, it's the variable default value that probably should have been different. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> okay, so another interesting class of issues are just null dereferences. So where, um, and one you know, heuristic that a, you know, a tool can use, there's maybe others, but one heuristic that can be used to, to recognize if a variable might be null is if the developer themselves checks that it might be null. So if, you know, a, you know, if, if a static analysis tool can recognize you know, that you know, if five out of six uses, you know, a particular variable is checked against null, but that sixth case, it wasn't checked against null, that's a good sign that that variable can be null and that they're missing one such check. And so that's something that could happen like this. Um, yeah, I'll just skip on. Um, so I don't have time to go through everything, but there's a whole you know, wide range. There's dozens and dozens or hundreds of different types of issues that can be found statically. So I'll just kind of um, leave this up here for a second just so that people can get a feel for different things. But um, you know, like logic errors are certainly a common class. Um, like things like integer overflows are obviously bad. Um, race conditions are obviously um, a really notoriously hard thing to find, but it's also um, very critical in many applications that there are you know, race conditions. Um, <clears throat> um, I think. So um, resource leaks, that's actually quite common. Java, for example, is a good language at doing good um, garbage collection and memory management in many ways. But there's certain things like, you know, uh, that, that, that it, you can't get around where you have to manually, you know, open and close the resource, things like, uh, you know, files, writes, or database connections. And so it's um, surprisingly common that, you know, that there maybe are different pathways through the code where things are not properly cleaned up. And we can, you know, a static analysis tool can quickly identify those kind of areas. Um, um, and the web application side, so we talked about some of the data flow ones, but a couple other classes that are interesting too, like you know, sensitive data exposure, um, where you maybe have um, something like a, you know, a, a social security number or credit card data or um, any other kind of, you know, maybe email addresses or phone numbers or home address or healthcare information. All these things are, are things that you want to make sure are being properly protected, and that oftentimes means 
you know, using proper encryption for that data or not displaying it in certain, to back to the user in certain contexts. Um, and so a good static analysis tool can identify those kind of issues and tell you, for example, if you know, you're not properly encrypting your credit cards. Um, another kind of related class is just you know, identifying bad crypto to begin with. So like if you're using, uh, you know, if you're uh, hashing your passwords before they get written to the database, that's obviously good practice, but you know, if you're not using proper salting, that's a bad thing because that makes you more vulnerable to brute force attacks and rainbow table attacks. Um, so that's something, again, that a static analysis tool can easily pick out. <clears throat> um, just a few other classes here. Um, don't want to spend too much time on all of these. Um, okay, so you know, just to kind of summarize, you know, where we're at. So there's obviously a lot of different kinds of bugs that can happen in your code, and things that are, and there's a lot of these bugs are going to be really hard to detect things, and um, and I, I like to use the example of like um, you know, like uh, like an author who writes books. So you know. Somebody, you know, an author who's maybe just beginning, or if like a student in school, they're maybe not going to use a professional editor. They maybe not have any editor at all. They'll, you know, do maybe do a good job at editing their own code, or excuse me, editing their own, you know, stories that they write, or you know, wh whatever it is they're writing. But you know, the more professional you get in the in the publishing world, then the more likely it is that you're going to be using a third-party editor for your code, right? or I keep saying code, um, for, your, for the, what you've written. And the analogy I'm trying to make is that it's the same in the, or it should be the same in the coding world, where, where if you're a student and you write your own code and you don't have any third party thing, you know, review it for errors, you know, that's maybe excusable. But as you get to the point where you're writing professional code and you're being paid to do this, that's really at the point where it should just be you know, standard that you have some sort of third party review. Now, now the case with, um, code, you probably want an automated tool just because the amount of code that gets written is so huge, it really you know, doesn't necessarily scale well to always be manually reviewing it. So you know, at the end of the day, you know, any professional developer, especially with Java, should you know, just day in, day out, be using some sort of static analysis tool to help you know, be identifying these kind of issues and making sure that they don't you know, slip through and make it into a production application. The other, you know, I, so I hate to use um, like fear, uncertainty, and doubt as a motivator, but you know, on the other hand, it is a thing that happens every now and then, and that, and that, you know, like a web application vulnerability is exploited, and and a particular uh, company or organization ends up, you know, being in the news because of this vulnerability. And nobody wants to, no company wants to be on the news saying, oh, they were exploited, or, or you know, they're, you know their passwords from the database were, dis were disclosed or, or their customer's credit card information was disclosed. These kinds of events can cost companies millions and millions of dollars, right? That's something that nobody wants to ha happen. And I, I hate to you know, pick on Robin here, but you know, even, I guess even worse for like an individual developer might be the case where, where that particular code that you checked in is traced back to you and then, and then you have like reporters coming up to you asking you for quotes about, hmm, why did you inject this vulnerability in the code? How did that happen? Um, so that was actually the case with uh, the Heartbleed vulnerability where, where it's open source code and it happens to be very, very critical code that's used by just about every organization in the world um, for doing SSL and things. And this particular develop, you know, this particular vulnerability, you know, could be traced back to a particular check-in of that code, and so they knew exactly who checked it in. And so, you know, Robin has the unfortunate distinction of being the person who checked in the Heartbleed vulnerability. So, I don't, like I said, I don't mean to pick on him too much. It wasn't just a failure on his side. Um, certainly, code review and other uh, you know, static analysis techniques and other things could have and should have caught this issue, especially in something as critical as OpenSSL. Or so. Um, but again, nobody wants to be that developer, right? <clears throat> so the end takeaway is just, you know, I want everybody to you know, really focus on how they can be a more intelligent, smarter developer. And you can do that by using the right tools, getting the right help, and by using tools that can find and eliminate bugs. And if you do that, that will really, really go a long way in terms of helping you move your develop development skills up to the next level. So that's it, thank you. So we have a few minutes. Any questions? Yep. Uh, what tools do you propose for like, open source? <clears throat> Great question. What tools do I propose? So if you're not doing anything at all, um, you should all immediately, today, tomorrow, tonight, go and download FindBugs and start using it. 
It's a great tool. It definitely will find lots of things. It's open source. There's no cost. And so it's the kind of thing that any individual developer can start doing. That being said, I did mention find bugs earlier as one of those tools that is shallow, right? It, it, it's coverage. You know, it covers a few areas, but it really misses a lot of key critical vulnerabilities. And so anybody that's doing professional Java development should immediately start looking at, you know, a more advanced tool. And there's a lot, uh, fortunately, in the open source world, find bugs is it for Java. Um, there's not a lot of really solid open source tools that can be used in place of it. Um, so you're going to have to turn to you know, proprietary applications, you know, things that you pay for. And the sad news is that um, all of these tools are expensive, um, compared to find bugs at least. But the good news is that if you compare you know, the cost of you know, some of these proprietary tools to like, what it might cost to do additional testing down the road, like uh, you know, to pay for additional penetration testing or whatnot, that's actually quite comparable or actually a good deal to start finding these issues earlier on. And so static analysis from that regard is, is actually can be quite a cost saver if you factor into the, you know, the full development lifecycle. So there's tools from HP, IBM, my company, Coverity, that all do this. And I just want to, you know, again, emphasize that you find the tool that has the right balance. You know, so a lot of these tools are maybe more geared towards a security consultant uh, rather than a, you know, uh, rather than a developer. Any other questions? It's hard to see. Ooh. Yeah. Um, a tool that can help with what kind of applications? Yeah. Okay. So, repeating for the sake of the audience, um, so you used a tool. It didn't find a lot of things. It had a lot of false positives. But this is for a Spring application. So you want to know what can help do better job. So. So uh, any kind of analysis will be very dependent on the code. So depending on how you do things, might you know tools might do better or worse. Um, but I would definitely would start you know looking to some of the paid tools that exist out there on the market, things like Coverity or some of the others. I don't want to be just plugging our tool, but I could say that I, I do know for a fact that Coverity does a very good job with Spring applications, for example. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the question is, can I uh, recommend maybe a tool that helps with dynamic testing, in particular things like with Java, where you have exposed endpoints that aren't necessarily through HTTP, but through other uh, endpoints? Um, I can, um, but I'm trying to think off of that. So I, I, there's lots of tools that I know that do that kind of testing. I don't know in particular which ones that would necessarily do a great job with the uh, JMS endpoints, for example, or JMX. Um, but the types of tools you'd want to look at are things like, um, uh, like, I'm trying to think. Uh, so uh, there's web application scanners that would uh, hopefully identify those types of issues. Like um, IBM has a tool called yeah. AppScan, which does that. Um, there's a tool called WebInspect. I think that was bought by HP that does that. Um, there's also runtime technology tools, like uh, Quodium has a tool called Seeker that might be able to detect those. I'm not positive. Um, and that happens in the interest of full disclosure. That's a company that we bought out, or we have announced that we're buying out. So just want to be clear there. <laughs> so uh, that kind of you know, runtime an analysis uh, testing might be able to find those as well, but I'm not positive. So those are a few things you could look at, yeah. Question? Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that uh, cloud storage or uh, security suffers because they cannot be um, statically analyzed as well as? So the question is, what about dynamic languages? Um, um, are we just in a worse state there because they can't be easily analyzed statically? And you bring up a good point in that implicitly, um, these kind of languages um, are more difficult to uh, to to 
analyzed statically because you know, various things, but in particular, a lot of these languages are untyped, and so, and so you lose a lot of information in terms of how, you know, what state the application can be in, um, which makes doing the you know, analysis itself much more difficult. But there's um, starting to be some new generation of tools that do a better job on those languages that, that despite some of these drawbacks, are coming up with new analysis techniques that will apply to dynamic languages. Um, uh, so, uh, Coverity, for example, again, don't want to be plugging just our company, but we have you know, JavaScript analysis coming out next week that um, will start to do a very good job at understanding JavaScript. Um, it'll take us you know, maybe another six months or a year before we have kind of a full package there, but it's something that will be much better than any, like, anything outside on the market right now. Um, but there are other tools that do cover it right now if you're looking for something like JavaScript, um, like IBM and HP's tools both have very broad language support and cover things like JavaScript and Ruby and probably Python. I don't know the full list, but it's, they cover those kind of languages as well. But in terms, if you kind of dig into what types of vulnerabilities they actually cover. So like for Java, they'll maybe have like a list of you know, 50 or 100 different issues they'll cover. For these other languages, it's usually a much shorter list. So you maybe are getting some coverage, but it's, but it's, it's gonna be much more shallow for these. So. Um, and on the open source side, maybe that's worth mentioning too. Like for um, uh, PHP, for example, I know there's some tools out there like uh, RIPS, R-I-P-S, um, that was written by a security friend. Um, that, probably better than, or as good as any like commercial tool you can get for PHP, but again, it doesn't do that great of a job at the end of the day, so. Um, well, one point I just wanted to make real quick, because we're talking about some of the dynamic testing and things. Um, you know, any mature organization is gonna adopt multiple strategies to find security issues. There's no one technique that will find everything. So static analysis can be like a great component to a larger part, and it's in particular the part that developers, I think, should be focusing on. But, you know, I had a list up there earlier of these other things like threat modeling and, you know, and, uh, you know, runtime, you know, testing or dynamic testing. Uh, a mature organization will be doing some combination of all of these so that, to make sure that the application is being as secure as possible. So just want to make sure that's clear. E each testing technique is going to kind of excel and do better job at finding some types of vulnerabilities than others. So any other questions? Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay, so let me try to repeat that real quick for the audience. Um, so the question is about web application firewalls, and in particular, um, um, embedded type of web application firewall. So to clarify what that means, so in my mind, I, I, I classify web application firewalls into two categories, those that are completely separate from the application and those that you know, I believe you're referring to as the embedded ones, um, and these usually are um, like provide like instrumentation into the application and run on the same server as part of the application, but are kind of still like an external wrapper to the application in some ways. Um, so of these two types, um, the first category is garbage, don't use them. Um, that's the easiest way to put it. Um, but they basically work by, by, by you pipe all of your HTTP traffic through the firewall before it actually hits your application, and then it will just look for bad things in that traffic. And you can do you know, training on them and profile and allow them to be smart so they're tuned to your application. But at the end of the day, they're still looking for bad things. And, and that means that they can always be bypassed using different techniques. I talked about, you know, with my cross-site scripting examples earlier, some of those things that could bypass firewall. Like I talked about the JS fuck, um, you know, characters. I've used that in many cases where, and where I was testing an application in production that, you know, uh, with the company's permission, they were paying me. Um, but they were using a web application firewall, and I used tricks like that in order to bypass the firewall. It's just it's because when, when you're in the game of looking for the bad things, there's always going to be new classes or new way bypass techniques that come up, and, and 
it's just kind of a losing game. So, but that then gets back to the embedded ones, which are definitely uh, a much higher class and much um, better in terms of quality, I would say. Um, I, I still think that some of these um, embedded type of web application firewalls still need to kind of be tested a little bit more before uh, I would really strongly recommend them to an organization. But if you are you know, dead set on using such a tool, um, definitely look on the more embedded ones. Yeah. So any other questions? Okay, so that looks like it. So again, thank you everybody for coming. If you'd like to come chat with me afterwards, I'll be around or down at the Coverty booth down on the second floor. So thank you. Thank you.